All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is your boy BQ with the negative BQ channel here on YouTube. And we're going to talk Bound for Glory. My previews, my predictions for a show that year to year, it usually is, is, even though we paint it as their WrestleMania, their number one show, it's usually the third or fourth um, show of the year, rankings wise. Usually, Slammiversary, A Heart to Kill is a, a pretty superior show to Bound for Glory. And then, uh, you know, Rebellion is, for me, has been a little hit or miss. I would say Rebellion is probably number four every year. But Bound for Glory is more like the number three. And the build every year, and the reason for this is that there's always something going on every year with contract statuses, who's going to be around after the show. You know, there, there's been there's been some years, and I understand this is in the past, but there's some years where they're building up to Bound for Glory and, uh, you know, a champion or champions leave the company before properly dropping the title. So there's always just question marks surrounding the show. And I think they, you know, they see the day after Bound for Glory as the start of the new kind of heading into the new year, I guess is what I'm saying. But I, I never really get that vibe. I never really feel like we wrap up Bound for Glory and then it's like, oh, wow, what's next? Because they follow it up with, you know, the silly Thanksgiving episode and then there's best of episodes in December. And and I usually think every year, and, and this is my opinion, I think the company loses a lot of momentum after Bound for Glory every year. You know, that's just the way that I perceive it. You may not agree with that, which is perfectly fine. But that's the way I perceive it, that they they lose quite a bit of momentum after the show. And the build is usually very, very lackluster. And even though I wasn't crazy about the way they built this card, I think it was better than they've done in the past. It just, it just... You know, year to year, BFG comes up. We think it's their WrestleMania, and it's not. It's not treated like their WrestleMania. They say it is. It isn't. It never is. Slammiversary is their number one show, and I wish they would just tell us that's the case. So uh, that being said, I'm going to run down this card here, give you my thoughts on what I think will happen. I know I, um, I kind of shit the bed on the cropping for this graphic here <laughs> that I've got. Um, so sorry if uh, it looks a little weird on the bottom. I don't know how it's going to ultimately show up on YouTube, but kind of mess up the cropping a little there. Um, but let's get into it. Let's get into Bound for Glory so we can make this quick and painless. Um, I'm hoping for a very good show. It's um, yeah, the We can sit here all day and be like, well, they didn't do a good job of building up to this show. And the matches are random, which is the case most of these matches are but typically they really really deliver at the pay-per-views because they don't suffer what AEW does where they try to put on these 20 minute matches throughout the whole entire night on free television throw everything including the kitchen sink at people everyone goes through tables everyone kicks out of finishers the matches never end and then the pay per view rolls around, and Tony K, uh, Tony K, Tony Khan feels like he has to, you know, do an eight eight hour pay per view because he has to extend the time on the matches and make them even crazier than what he does on television. So with Impact's televised matches, they're very, um, you know, it's pr it's very rare that they run too long. They're very well laid out for the most part. No one's kicking out of finishers and moves that they don't need to be we're not unnecessarily adding tables to the matches and just just doing all sorts of nonsense it's it's a very logical wrestling pr promotion very logical wrestling show in the ring i'm saying not creatively or not the backstage segments but in the ring everything happens very logically and then when the pay-per-view rolls around they can kick it up a notch they can kick out of some of the moves that they wouldn't kick out on television. Like there's there's a formula that they follow and it works. And it works 
and we enjoy the pay-per-views for the most part. I think the times we don't enjoy the pay-per-views is when they they overbook things, which there's no doubt in my mind that something on here isn't going to be overbooked. It's usually towards the end of the match. I'm going to say it's probably the the world championship match, but something's going to be overbooked on here. That's it. You cannot go through a whole impact pay-per-view without that being the case. So let's, let's run this down. I'm going to kind of start from the bottom and leave the world championship for, for the very end. I'm going to start with the call your shot gauntlet. I haven't really expressed my feelings of this match in a while. When they first made this a thing, I thought they dropped the ball tremendously on how they promoted it. I would, rather than using precious social media time to show you clips of Sting retiring, I think that there's things that they can do with the Call Your Shot gauntlet, which I think they've been able to do for years or could have done for years, is, you know, one by one, announce who's in the freaking match. Now, we know there's going to be, you know, four surprise entrances. That's usually the magic number. One, you know, one or two of them is pretty cool. One is someone probably old that shouldn't be in the ring. Like, like what's his name? Um, the Nunzio dude, whatever the hell his name is. I, I, I would bet money, and I'm I'm a betting man, so I'm okay losing money. But I I would bet money that he's one of the surprise entrants. And then there's usually usually something silly in there. Uh, for one of the entrances, you know, Swoggle's been there a couple times, the Demon. So, you know, I think considering there's 16 other competitors, what's wrong with, instead of putting all this time into showing us old Christian Cage graphics because he appears on Impact Television, why not put little 30-second clips making someone look good and announcing them for the gauntlet on social media. Even if it's freaking champagne sing, but then he gets, you know, a 30 second clip of actually kicking some ass in the ring. I, I I just think there, there's a way to make it because there's big stakes here with the call your shot gauntlet. The first mat, the first one I had a lot of fun watching. I was at, I was there in Chicago. I had a lot of fun watching that match, but it meant jack shit. Eddie Edwards won, never really got a title shot. And you can argue that he did, but all he did was, was enter a four-way match that, you know, the other competitors didn't have to do anything special for. That's what he cashed in for. So I thought that really shit the bed with that. The first two years have had the person who come in at number one, win the match. The person who draws number 20, has usually been one of the shorter uh, entrants in the match. So I don't think they've done a great job of like laying this thing out, but I think it's been better from year to year. You know, um, I think from year to year, it's starting to feel like it actually means something. I think this is the year though, that the knockout wins. I think this is the Jordan grace year. I know they are, teasing that Jake something is going to win this thing. And I think he's going to be, I think he's going to be there in the end. I think he's going to be the third number one competitor to last to the very end of the fucking match. But I don't think he's going to win. I I do think uh, this is the Jordan grace year. I think it's the knockout year. If it's not this year, it's going to be next year. But um, I, I, it's a storyline. I see for Jordan grace holding around the, the number one dad trophy that they hand out and, you know, cashing in on, on someone eventually Mickey James or um, Trinity or whoever it is. But I think the knockouts world title picture is so much more entertaining right now than the world championship, the men's world championship. It just feels natural for me. It feels right for me. It feels like it's the Jordan Grace year because what is what is Jordan Grace doing otherwise? Like this sets her up for doing something. Of everyone in this match, it just seems like she's the one that that needs like what's next for her. Because you got to remember, she just resigned with the company. You think she resigned for to just just return because she's happy to be here? 
Like there's got to be some creative plans in that re-signing. And I do think it starts with a call your shot gauntlet. And um, Dango coming in at number 20, I think is just going to be the next number 20 entrant to last about five seconds in the match. Let's move on to Will Ospreay versus Mike Bailey. I was really critical about this when this came out because I think it's it's what Impact perceives to be a dream match. But I thought they um, they missed an opportunity. So what I was explaining, you know, when it comes to promotion and when it comes to marketing something, you use a, a 70-30 scale or you can even say a 60-30, I mean, excuse me, a 60-40 scale where 60% of your product or 70% of, of the show, I should say, is built to entertain the people who already watch the show. That other 30 or that other 40, that's where you try to bring in a new audience. I use the same strategy here on the channel. 70% of what I do is for my subscribers. And then you're going to see my Billy Corgan is Billy Corgan's independent promotions going to ruin the future of impact video and WWE firings. And where are they going to sign? And is CM Punk coming to impact? Okay. You get very little of that from me and the rest is for my subscribers because I do have to create a certain amount of content that is going to attract new subscribers or at least give them a chance to check me out. If they, they choose, they don't like the content. Cool. But I have to reach out and I got to fish out a little bit. That's just the way it works. Will Ospreay was the only opportunity on this entire card to do that. But since they put him in a match that falls into that 60%, that 40% of people who already watch the show, that means you got to work that much harder to build the card if you're trying to get outsiders to purchase the pay-per-view. I hope that makes sense, the picture I'm trying to paint to you. Although I think this is going to be a good match, there's been no build. Um, I mean, non-existent. Will Ospreay... I mean, excuse me, Mike Bailey acknowledged him on TV the other day. They they don't even have Will Ospreay sending in promos for this. This is just what they perceive to be a dream match. They think people are going to buy the pay-per-view for it because he's the best wrestler in the world. But nobody knows who Speedball Mike Bailey is, which is the problem. We know here as the Impact audience that this guy can go. That he has put on some of the best matches over the past two years that Impact has done. We know that, but can you honestly say the way that they've promoted this match is doing anything to bring anybody from the outside in and say, hey, let me buy Bound for Glory? Because the thing is, too, Will Ospreay's doing matches on AEW television. This isn't like um, Will Ospreay's only match in the United States for the, for the year. He's already doing AEW stuff, and he is doing this along the way. He's going to beat Mike Bailey. You know, maybe they needed to give him a beatable opponent because I understand this was supposed to be a multiverse United match. I really thought they should have, they should have zigged on this one or zagged or however you want to say it. I think he should have been involved in the world title picture or wrestle Josh Alexander. That's, that's what I think. I think this is going to do nothing for bound for glory other than give us a really good match that Will Ospreay is going to win. And if he is, in fact, on his way to AEW, which people suspect he is, Scott DeCuck is not going to have an impact wrestler beat him. He, Tony Khan didn't allow that last time. And if Will Ospreay moves on here and wins the world title, that's why I don't think Josh Alexander is going to win, because if Will Ospreay is in a position to win the world title and he wins it, we're going to have Kenny Omega all over again. And nobody wants that. Maybe they do. We don't. The fans, that did not work with the fans ultimately. We were excited about it first. It ultimately didn't work, and it's going to happen again. So Will Ospreay, I got him winning a match, which which should be really good. I think it's probably going to be the, I would imagine it's the opening match. And that's usually the match that gets people excited, but it's also like the, 
I don't want to call it the throwaway, but it's like, I think it's in a bad position to just hype up the crowd with a match because then you don't really care about the outcome. You just, you just care about seeing a good wrestling match. I don't, I don't know. I don't think I'm making sense what I'm saying just for um, reference. It is four in the morning for me. (laughs) I am uh, recording this review and then I have to work for like four hours and then we are on our way to Cali for our wedding and we'll be out of pocket. So I'm I'm going to repeat this because I have my last couple of podcasts. I will not, not, not be streaming a review of Bound for Glory right after the show. Because I will be out of town for my wedding, I will be back Monday. And I will very likely review Bound for Glory Monday night. I will not be reviewing Impact this week for that reason. Impact World Tag Team Championships, uh, the Rascals facing... The ABC, a name that I hate very much. This is another one that's going to be really, really good. Uh, By the way, um, drinking game, take a shot every time that Tom Haddafin says this is a first time ever matchup on this uh, on this card here. That being said, I don't think this is a first time matchup. I'm fairly certain these guys have wrestled before. I'm, I'm pretty sure they have. This will probably be one of the show stealers of the pay-per-view. I am not a huge fan of the two high-flying tag teams that that, uh, coordinate spots with each other and cooperate and, and flip and dive and roll and dip and duck and dodge, you know. It is not a style of wrestling I particularly care for. Like, I will be more interested in Chris Saban versus Kenta. I'll be a little more, even though I find them both boring, I'll find, uh, I'll have more interest in like Josh Shelley and, uh, excuse me, Josh Alexander and Alex Shelley. You know, that's stuff I have a little bit more interest in. Um, tag team matches like this, like even though I'll, I will acknowledge that they are good and they're entertaining and they're impressive and everything they're doing, I tend to check out a little bit during them. But with the Rascals, this is a team that I like quite a bit. I didn't like their babyface run at all. I know they were really popular with the Impact fans. They were not with me. But this uh, this version of Trey Miguel, this version of Wentz, I'm a really big fan of. I like to see them retain the title here. I don't know that they will, though. Um, I'm going to say that Ace Austin and Chris Bay win this thing. I think we're I think we're gonna get some some hot shotting with the tag team championships to be honest because uh, the the tag team division is in a really good place. It's probably the best place that it's been in a really long time. The Good Brothers really hurt this division, and it took them a while to bounce back from it. And they're there now. Um, but I'm saying ABC is gonna win because every time I think there's a guy like Trey Miguel or heel ace Austin when he's like X division champion. I'm like, yo, this guy can really benefit for a long title run. You know, Kenny King, even for the, the digital media championship, they always seem to take the title off that person. And I think they are going to put it back on the ABC. I would prefer they don't, but I am going to, um, I'm going to say they are the rascals right now are doing really good work. They, they got a lot of heat for, um, Getting Jabba Mura. I said I wouldn't call him that anymore. Yuamura ultimately fired. They win with the spray paint every single match. They cheat every match. And Tom Hannafin is making a point to make it a point to point it out <laughs> that all oh, the rascals, they they have cheated every single match since they have been the Impact World Champions. Uh, every first time matchup they have they have cheated. So I think that's the story they're telling is that they need to cheat to win. And um, I, I think I wouldn't be surprised if ABC doesn't use the the spray paint on them. It's kind of a played out way of going about things, but that's kind of where I think they're, they're going with it. Knockouts Tag Team Championship, MK Ultra versus Tasha Steeles and Deanna Perrazzo. I'm going to say this again. MK Ultra is the best thing to happen to the Knockouts Tag Team Division in a really, really 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 long time however they made the mistake 
at one of these Impact Plus shows of putting him in a freaking four-way match. Unnecessary. Unnecessarily put him in a four-way match. Instead of just feeding him one of those tag teams and then moving on to the next tag team and moving on to the next tag team. But because they can't help themselves and they blew their load, they put up all in one match. And then MK Ultra has had jack shit to do ever since. And you can imagine you you could you could argue they have lost momentum because Killer Kelly lost a really bad match to Tasha Steeles a couple weeks ago. And now they mean a lot less than they than they should. Like they're not going into Bound for Glory strong, which is a problem for me. Tasha Steeles and Deanna Perazzo, a very thrown together tag team. I don't care how you try to flip this. Well, they they had a you know they teamed up once before and they they did this and on BTI and they cut this promo and and you know I don't care how you try to flip this. Impact said we have no challengers. There are no challengers on the indies that we could bring in. I've always said I thought they botched um, botched the hex. You know, instead of bringing them in on on one of the worst episodes of Impact that they have done in years. Um, that was the one where it kicked off with Brian Myers versus, you know, Dirty Dango, number one contender for the world title. Instead of bringing him in that match and then uh, two weeks later having him lose on Impact Plus, that, w- that was a big botch for me. I thought that was a team you could have brought in for Bound for Glory, for Slammiversary. But they had no opponents, so they, they made a team up. And because, because they are a team, they get a title shot. That's how it works in Impact. All you have to do is put a team together, and you will challenge for the belts. Which is some of, when I'm talking about things that are not logical with the storylines, when you're putting guys in feast or fired matches and, you know, they are putting their careers on the line when it's so easy to just get a title match. Like, I wouldn't enter the match. I wouldn't even try to grab the briefcase. I'm like, I'll just ask for a title match the next week and get it. I don't know. Um, no, I do know. I was going to say I don't know how good this match will be, but um, Kelly and um, and Masha and Deanna are all so good in the ring. Tasha Steeles is not a ring general by any means, but she she brings the flavor, if you will. You know she's a great character, and I think I think this is going to be a very entertaining match. It's it's probably the one I'm kind of looking forward to the most, just because I'm kind of invested in MK Ultra. Diana Perazzo is the real Knockouts champion, and Tasha Steeles is doing great work right now, just coming off like more and more of a star every time she's on screen. Who do I think is going to win this though? Um, I, I think if MK Ultra won, it would be. I, was, I think it would be kind of a cold finish because they just don't have any momentum. Um, but I think they're going to win. But it's going to be very telling because if Tasha and Deanna lose, people are going to be under the assumption that Perazzo's on her way out of the company. And, you know, that, that could be true. Like, she's got a pretty good home in Impact. I think they've done a really good job of always finding something for her to do. You know, she did the champ champ thing and... And she was, you know, won the title immediately. She's had multiple title reigns. But when she wasn't the champion, they've always found something for her to do. It wasn't like, um, I'm trying to think of a a good example. Um, damn, I don't got one off the top of my head. I, you could say maybe Ty Valkyrie when she dropped the knockouts title. Sometimes someone drops a title and then they're like in oblivion and it's like, I don't know. We have no plan for them now. What the hell are we going to do with them? We know how to book them as a champion, but we don't know how to book them as a challenger or someone chasing or someone not in the title picture. Deanna, you can argue, has always had something to do that made her seem important. So a knockouts title run, tag team title run would be great. I think MK Ultra should never lose. But I am going to say here that MK Ultra wins. You know what? No, 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 no. 
because they have no challengers after this. You can get a a, a program out of Deanna and Tasha being the champs. So I'm going to say Deanna and Tasha win this thing. I think they're going to be the champions. I think I think it's a little random of a pairing, but it can be very entertaining. So I'm going to say they win. Impact's X, Impact X Division Championship, Chris Sabin versus Kenta. This is one of the ones I'm looking forward to a little bit more. Chris Sabin is a little flippy for my taste sometimes, but Kenta is someone that uh, I, I can really get behind in the ring, and I think they're going to put together a really good match. Um, definitely a top two match on this card. I think it'll be better than Osprey and Bailey personally, just because of the position. Seeing Will Ospreay come in with absolutely no story, no build, no reason to care about this match. At least they did some video packages for Chris Saban and Kenta. But that's me. I need a reason to care about a match. There's some people who are perfectly fine with the dream match and two random people fighting each other. AEW has built a brand off it, you know. But Chris Saban versus Kenta, I, I don't expect Kenta to win this thing. I hope that he does stick around for a little bit. I hope that he sticks around all the way through uh, Hard to Kill. But I don't expect him to win this match. I think uh, Chris Saban's going to be your dude. I think he's going to you know, retain this thing. Um, and I, th- I just... Um, but I, I really have a feeling this is going to be... Uh, even though Kenta's a little older, like this is going to be the match. Like I think it's just... It's going to be one that we we really look at because I think this is going to happen around the point of the card. If it happens towards the end of the card where the, you know, the, the announcers are a little more into it and the fans start getting like, you know, really fired up. Like I just, I just see a good atmosphere for this match. And uh, it's our first time ever matchup impact knockouts, world championship Trinity versus Mickey James, two biggest names on this whole card in, um, you know, for being honest with each other. They were always building towards this. It was crystal clear. Stevie Wonder could see it through a brick wall for months that this is where they were going with it. You knew it before Mickey was hurt. You knew it while she was hurt. Um, I hope Trinity kicks that fake accent out of her and we get the old Mickey James back. I don't particularly expect this to be a great match because I don't really think either of them are that good in the ring. I think they're great characters. I think they're popular i think they're stars i don't think they're going to have any i i find mickey james to be a lot better in the ring than trinity but i i'm not expecting a lot of cohesion i'm not expecting them to have a lot of chemistry i you might you might totally disagree with me on that i don't think it's going to be a really good match (laughs) This is a tough one to call who's going to win because what I've, what I've always said, not always, but ever since Trinity's been in the company, is that he, she will lose one match in this company and it'll be when she drops a knockouts title. I could be very wrong. She could sign a long-term deal with Impact, she decide she likes it here, and, and keep going. I could be totally wrong. But right now my gut tells me she's going to lose one match like she's going to be pinned once because I don't think she's ever been pinned in Impact. She does these title match, you know, she's tag team matches. I have not, you know, this is before Impact tonight, okay? But she does these tag team matches with her opponent. The opponent loses, you know, I mean, not the opponent, her partner loses. I guess you understand what I'm saying. Her opponent is her partner and her partner is the one who loses the match. That's what I was trying to say. I don't think Trinity's ever been beaten in Impact. And I don't think she will. I th- well, I mean, she will. But she's going to drop one match, and that's going to be it. I'm kind of having a hard time believing she is dropping a Bound for Glory. It would make sense because it seems like they let a lot of, peop- a lot of people go or a lot of people depart after Bound for Glory. But I feel like Trinity's run is still a thing. So... um I'm going to say that she retains against Mickey James and that she ultimately loses to Jordan Grace via via um, Call Your Shot Gauntlet. So that's where I think that is going. And then your Impact World Championship match, Alex Shelley versus Josh Alexander. 
they have done a much better with this build than I was expecting them to do. I expected the most boring build in the history of Impact Wrestling with two of the most boring guys in the history of Impact Wrestling. Both guys who can go in the ring, and this is very likely going to be the match of the night, but they've done a good job of adding a little bit of a heel persona to Alex Shelley, finding a reason to you know, create a little bit of heat between the two. You know, I always said when Josh wrestled, wrestled uh, Eddie Edwards a year or so ago, I was like, this is the fakest heat I've ever seen in my life that they're trying to drum up in this match. And that's the problem when you just put two guys together and then find a reason for them to have heat rather than let things kind of happen organically within the flow of some of the stories and then build towards something. But when you decide um, that something's a dream match in your head, even though these guys have wrestled once before, then you have to be like, okay, let's find a reason for them to hate each other now. And it doesn't always come off natural. I think Alex Shelley is going to win this thing. I don't think Josh, um, he's the golden boy of impact and all that. I don't think he's getting the title back just yet. I don't think we're going to have two back to back, like transitional champions. I thought I'm um, putting the title on him to begin with was a mistake. I thought Macklin should have had a long run. And I think this should, I thought this should have been the Macklin spot here to where Macklin is a champion for a year. And then Josh Alexander comes and gets his title back. It's kind of unprecedented that the guy, the champion was feuding with before injury, uh, won the title and then dropped the title to someone completely different and fell out of the picture totally. And the champion, you know, the previous champion comes back and is wrestling someone different. Like that, that's, that is not a story that typically happens. So when Alex Shelley won this thing, nobody saw it coming. And I mean, nobody. So um, they've done, as I said, they've done a pretty decent match in building something here. I mean, a pretty decent job in building something here to where there's like a little bit of heat. I just don't see Josh Alexander wrestling Will Ospreay as the world champion. I don't see them beating Will Ospreay. At a, at the, I can see Josh Alexander Will Ospreay to a time limit draw, but I don't see anybody on the Impact roster beating Will Ospreay who just beat Chris Jericho and Kenny Omega and um, I forgot who from Japan. I, I, I always say the three names. I, I just don't see it. So I don't see Ospreay wrestling for the world title. And then if you look at the turning point matches, Alex Shelley and Chris Saban against Moose and Brian Myers, like Moose, the de facto number one contender. And then you got Josh randomly teaming with EY against job culture. Like, I'm, I don't know. And I, I call them that because of how they've been presented on Impact Television, not what they do in the United, the United Kingdom. I understand that the UK, in the UK, they're a much bigger deal. And in tur- a turning point, they'll be a much bigger deal. But um, we basically saw them win once on Impact Television. It was to win the belts, and then that was like about it. I think they won one other match. But if you're re- just reading between the lines, maybe they're trying to throw us off. I don't see the world champion randomly teaming with EY to wrestle subculture while the world champion wrestles the guy who's about to take his spot in Moose. I just I cannot see that. I don't see people... I'd really wanting Moose versus Josh Alexander again. Moose versus Alex Shelley is a lot fresher. But there's also people who think Moose is designed to cash in on Josh Alexander. Like that's always going to be there. And maybe maybe that is what it is. Maybe they see Josh Alexander and Moose as that rock and stone cold feud that you can revisit anytime you want. And then the story is Moose always screws him over. Maybe... <laughs> That would be insane if it happened at Bound for Glory again. Damn you, Moose. But I do think Alex Shelley is the um, the ultimate winner here. I think they're going to ch- um, maybe tease Moose. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if they're going to actually do Moose versus Alex Shelley. I don't think many people want to see that. It's fresher. I don't know how much people want to see it, though. So it's going to be interesting. I don't really know what they're going to do with the world title. But I do think Alex Shelley is going to win this match. So, yeah, um, we're wrapping this up. I, I think overall Bound for Glory should be a pretty 
pretty entertaining show because it's really rare that they don't deliver on these pay-per-views. Really, really rare. And with the lineup that they do have, there's no reason it can't deliver. Are there stories here? Do I give a shit about the matches and who wins half of these? No, I don't. And and that's why, that's why stories are important. Like, like, do you care who wins between Chris Saban and Santa, uh, Kenta? Do you care who wins between Will Ospreay and Mike Bailey versus, you know, uh, Trinity and Mickey James? Like, do you care? Because the Trinity and Mickey James story hasn't been good either. Do you even care who wins between Alex Shelley and Josh Alexander? You know, we got two babyface versus babyface matches at the very top of this card. So, you know, that's why stories are, imp- are important. These are booked to where Impact believes that they're dream matches for the most part. So that's that's just the issue I have for Bound for Glory or with Bound for Glory. But as I said, should be a good show. So I'm, I'm not um, going to hate on it too much. <sighs> that is going to wrap it up for me, folks. Thanks for checking me out, as you always do. And we will be talking um, a couple days after Bound for Glory. I'm your boy, BQ. I'm out. Peace.